morning, everybody. It's great to see familiar faces and be back here again. It's been a long time for me, so it, it feels great. My name is Carl Davis. I'll be the acting deacon today. Uh, another beautiful summer day. The summer of 2022 just seems to be the summer that keeps on giving this great weather. So please join me in the call to worship. We will read in unison. It's in your bulletins. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. For thine art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
Ja, han kan det også. Ja. And silence. Jesus said, Your sins are forgiven. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning's scripture reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 9 through 25, page 976 in your pew Bible. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Pulpit, but uh, can you hear me all right with this, uh, with this mic? Is that okay? Uh, I was the pastor of the uh, Old West United Methodist Church uh, in, on Cambridge Street in Boston, and uh, the uh, pulpit had about 11 steps. And so I was preaching to the balcony. It was not very intimate. I prefer intimacy, so here I am, and glad to be here, glad your pastor called, he needed a, a preacher, and uh, he's, I'm very fond of him, and uh, uh, glad to help. I was here a year ago, and it was the remnant of Hurricane Ida. I arrived just as Dave was finishing the prelude, and what a nice day for me. Uh, friends are here along with all of you, I'm glad to see all of you, and uh, here we have two other reverends, uh, uh, Vicki Guest and uh, Jonathan Guest, both uh, beloved uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, Vicki and I worked together at First Congregational Church in uh, Natick, and once a month we used to do a dialogue sermon. It was differentiating among the churches of uh, Natick, and uh, always great fun, and um, Sometimes uh, for Vicki, it was a little tough. When I would arrive on a Sunday morning, after we had already prepared our sermon, and tell her, I got a new idea. <laughs> and uh, it would be a little bit disconcerting. And then Christine Van Zadelhoff. Shirley and I love Christine. We're glad to see her. Uh, I first met Christine in 1973 in the Netherlands. Uh, it was one of my Foxborough company days, and I worked with her husband, the late uh, Rob, who would have no trouble speaking to the balcony. He was a, a, a big guy. And I officiated the marriage of uh, Christine and Rob's uh, 
daughter, uh, Rosemary, and baptized uh, with Vicki Guest, uh, their four children at First Congregational Church. And I was reminding uh, Christine that it was unique for me because the last one that I baptized was Alex, the youngest. He was a little boy. He walked up to me, his arm full of stuffed animals. And he looked at me, opened his eyes, dropped all the uh, animals on the floor. I baptized him, and the only time in my life he said, thank you. <laughs> Charming. I love seeing, I see pictures of them on uh, uh, Facebook. Well, uh, I want to begin by mentioning a, uh, a great preacher and teacher of preachers, Fred Craddock. I know I've used Fred from time to time uh, here at, um, at Pilgrim Church. Uh, he was a great uh, storyteller. He was from Tennessee. He knew his Bible from Genesis right through to Revelation. He was a small man, had a tear in his voice. But I remember going to a conference, a preaching conference with Fred. He was a, such a great storyteller. He told a story about waiting in line for an injection in a, a hospital. And it was one of the most hilarious things I've ever heard and had a very good point. I mentioned Fred this morning because while I am devoted to him, I've read his books, I've uh, gone to this conference with him, I have benefited. Uh, my preaching, storytelling has benefited from Fred, but I'm going to do something that he said never do this morning. Never tell a joke at the beginning of a sermon. I'll tell you why after I tell you the joke. Now, now to get this joke, sometime in your history, you have had to have seen maybe a photo of the painting, the famous painting of Whistler's mother. Perhaps some of you have seen the real thing on tour or been to Paris to the Musée d'Orsay and uh, seen the original, uh, the, the French own it. Uh, James McNeil Whistler uh, painted it in London in 1871, and it's become one of the most famous paintings ever. Uh, it's been called an American icon, uh, a Victorian Mona Lisa. Well, anyway, uh, when McNeil uh, uh, Whistler painted it, he, he didn't call it his, about his mother. He said, arrangement in gray and black, number one. We know it as Whistler's mother. So here's the joke. James McNeil Whistler, the artist, comes home at night. His mother is on her hands and knees scrubbing the floor. And Whistler says, Mom, you're off your rocker. <laughs> well, uh, I choose to start there because in the living of these days, we can be forgiven if from time to time we are off our rocker. A little crazy about what is going on. We're in the third year of the COVID pandemic. Most of us wake up every morning, shall I wear a mask? Shall I not wear a mask? Panic is standing in the middle of Roach Brothers and realizing, I haven't got a mask on. And you look all around, and oh my goodness, nobody else is wearing a mask either. It's been a challenge, and it's affected our lives deeply, this pandemic. And then heat waves. It's lovely today, the temperature's nice. A week ago, we were in the sixth day of greater than 90 degree uh, temperatures. What, what a siege. And we haven't had the worst of it. America, other parts, the American West and Southwest, it's been brutal. In Dallas today, it's very high. And France and Italy, and uh, in the August 1st, uh, or the uh, New Yorker uh, magazine, there was an article called Fahrenheit 121. You could see where it's going. It was an article uh, written about 
heat waves in India. More than 100 people have died in India from heat waves. And it's affected their whole society, their economy, their, their daily uh, uh, living. Uh, this article reports that an international meteorological society has kept track of uh, heat waves for many years. Since 1980, there are 50 times more uh, heat waves uh, than formerly. Imagine 50 times more heat waves. Uh, climate change is with us. And then there's this ugly war in Ukraine. It feels like we're back in the 1930s. Uh, uh, a big country like Russia invading a small country like the Ukraine. The president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, offering up nuclear threats. Feels like the 1960s when people were building you know, shelters in the backyard. It's enough to just worry you uh, a little bit. The head of the Russian Orthodox Church has given his blessing uh, to this war. In the same issue of the New Yorker, August 1st, there's an article, uh, the letter from the Donbass. And uh, the point of the article is uh, about what the war is having as an effect on people. The article is called, uh, Everyone's a Target. And in the Donbass right now, which is under siege by the Russian army, uh, Ukrainians say it's either loud or quiet. When it's loud, there are missiles and artillery brutalizing human beings, civil, civilians, uh, destroying uh, the country. It's alarming. It's discouraging. And then uh, we move to uh, American politics. What a week we've had. We're at each other's throats again. Desperate polarization. A young man attacking a, an IBM office in Cincinnati and losing his life. And it's just all so sad. You remember when Americans were uh, thought of as uh, generous, kind, problem solvers, optimistic? Not anymore. You remember when our democracy was looked at as the light of the world? Not anymore. And I don't even want to touch the new oxymoron, Christian nationalism. So how's that all feeling? You come to church for a little cheer, and here we go through all these problems. And the danger is we slip into negativism indifference, uh, uh, live our lives with this cloud of concern uh, hanging over us. And where do we go for some help? Well, Christians go to Jesus. Christians go to their book, the Bible. And in the, the book this week, one of the readings that's... Uh, recommended for the, for, from the lectionary is from the letter to the Hebrews. You know, the Hebrews is a wonderful book. It's elegant. It's profound. It's neglected. It was written in the first, latter part of the first century, somewhere between 60 in the Common Era and 90 in the Common Era. We don't know who wrote it. For the first couple of centuries, it was credited to Paul the Apostle, but it's not a letter of Paul. There's no typical salutation. There's no uh, homey references throughout the dialogue. The theology even is a little bit uh, different. So we don't know who the author is, but what a gift he has given to us. Uh, there are so many wonderful passages 
in Hebrews, memorable uh, passages. And when we uh, consider what's there, the, uh, the, the lectionary reading that was recommended is from the 11th chapter, which we didn't read this morning, and I'll say why. Uh, because um, it has a, uh, a statement that I know you've heard many times, but think of the first century. Christians were a little discouraged. The Romans occupied the Holy Land. Jesus had not returned. So Hebrews is trying to pump people up a little bit, get them to get back to living their lives with hope. And so in the 11th chapter of uh, Hebrews, there is, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us cast aside every weight and sin. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Isn't that a great, great uh, statement? And the key word for me is perseverance. You have to choose perseverance every day. We got all these weighty problems, we got all these things that get in our way, but choose perseverance. Now I chose for this morning's reading the 10th chapter. I spent the whole week with Hebrews, loved it, it was great. In the 10th chapter of Hebrews, verses 23 through 25, reinforce the notion of hope. The writer says, let us hang on to hope and promise. Let us not neglect to worship together, to be together. And for sure, let us provoke one another to deeds of love, deeds of good work. And I, I did look at the, um, the Message Bible. Do any of you know the Message Bible by Eugene Peterson? It's a, uh, a paraphrase of the whole Bible. And I, I always look at it after I've uh, read the New Revised Standard Version, and I haven't mastered it, so I had to write it down. Let me read you how Eugene Peterson translates Hebrews 10, verses 23 to 25. I love the opening. So let's do it. Full of belief. Confident that we're presentable inside and out. Let us lay aside every weight and sin. Let's keep our grip firm on the promises that keep us going. Let us see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping, uh, helping out, not, not avoiding, worshiping together, spurring each other on. You know, even in this pandemic, isn't it wonderful to be able to be here and see each other face to face, real persons who have cast aside all the negative things uh, for today? Well, the scriptures offer hope for those who persevere. And persevering is about helping out, doing works of love. In my uh, long career, uh, many times I have been asked, why are you not a Unitarian? Uh, I'm not offended. I admire Unitarians. I admire their commitment to social justice. And I hate to put it this way, but some of my best friends have been Unitarian ministers. When I was a pastor in Boston, we had a Boston Ministers Association. The folk who showed up most often and in great numbers were the Unitarian ministers. Jack Mendelson was the notable pastor of the Arlington Street Church, one of the great churches in Boston, the corner of Arlington and Boylston. Reese Williams, what a dignified, wonderful man he was. He was the pastor of the first church in Boston. Now it's the first and second church. Uh, Reese invited me to preach at uh, his 
church. I went there once. We became very good friends. He owned a home in Southwest Harbor, and Shirley and I owned a home on Swans Island, uh, five miles off the coast. And then there was Don Lothrop. He was the pastor of the community church of Boston, the one that moves around from place to place. And he used to make the best fish chowder <laughs> for our uh, Boston minister meetings. That I always felt sorry for the others who didn't uh, show up. So I have had many uh, friends who were Unitarians. But why am I not a Unitarian? Because I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the narrative of my faith. He is my hope. He is my motivator to do works of love. He is the one that makes me persevere. And I am thrilled, pleased to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. In fact, to be a member of the United Church of Christ. And so we, as a people, are hopeful. We get together to spur each other on. I wanted uh, Dave to uh, uh, change the last hymn to uh, God of Grace and God of Glory, but he said you've sung it so many times. Hooray for you, it's a great hymn. Uh, it was written by Harry Emerson Fosdick. Now back in the day when I was learning how to become a minister, Harry Emerson Fosdick was a model. He wrote his autobiography, it was called a living of these days. I read it at least twice, and I think I've had three copies, and it helped me immensely. He was such a witness uh, for all America. He, uh, he wrote the hymn in 1930. It was first sung in 1931, the consecration of Riverside Church, that majestic uh, church. It's upper Manhattan, close to the Hudson, near Columbia, near Union Theological School, a wonderful church, it's been served by great pastors. Harry Harrison Fosdick was the first. He was uh, the builder, if you will. John D. Rockefeller gave Harry Emerson Fosdick $5 million back in the 1920s to build a new church that would be open to everyone. And Rockefeller said to Fosdick, I don't know how all my friends are going to feel about me giving money to this liberal pastor. And Fosdick said, how do you think my friends are going to be <laughs> taking $5 million from John D. Rockefeller? But in that great hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, you may remember that the concluding verses are, grant us wisdom Grant us courage for the living of these days. And then he repeats it. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the living of these days, serving thee. It's a great hymn. So, so let's do it. Let's come to church. Let's be together. Let's spur one another on to acts of love. Let us remember we are a hopeful people. That's the promise of the gospel, hope. And finally, every day in the difficult living of these days, choose perseverance. So, let's do it. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that we are presentable.
inside and out, a forgiven people. We're thankful that we have a promise and we are a people of hope. Help us in the living of these days to be together, to worship together, to spur one another on to acts of love and helping. And we pray for all those around the world who are suffering from heat and exhaustion in these days. We're grateful for this lovely day, but we think of our brothers and sisters who are coping with heat waves. We remember the Ukrainians. We pray that this may be not a loud day, but a quiet day. And we pray for our country. Help us to come together. Help us to celebrate what unites us. Help us to be loving and forgiving and help us to listen to one another. Help us to regain hope. All these prayers we ask in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. And now we have an opportunity to uh, provoke one another to acts of love and helping. Uh, uh, the ushers will wait upon you with the offering.
spirits. Amen. So let's do it. Let's worship together. Let us affirm hope. Let us spur one another to acts of love and helping. And let us choose perseverance every day. Go in peace, and the God of peace go with you. Amen. <laughs>